You may have noticed that the big event of the night here on BBC Two is the network television premiere of Tarantino's Pulp Fiction and to prepare you for the extraordinary use of violence, drug abuse and strong language. A taste of what's to come from those in the know. In 15 minutes or so, you are going to see one of the most contested, most fought over artifacts that this decade has produced. The film, of course, is Pulp Fiction. If your head is any way in the present, you've probably already seen it. If you watch any TV or read any magazines at all, you'll have caught the whiff of its stylistic slipstream. Its graphics and language were all over the place. Its dling -ling 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 guitar intro was copied to death by cheap TV. And now, for the first time on network British television, is the thing itself in all its dazzling, heartless glory. <laughs> Pulp Fiction was premiered at the Cannes Film Festival where it won the Palme d'Or, the top prize. It got seven Oscar nominations and won for Best Screenplay. The script also won at the BAFTAs and the Golden Globes. The film turned Tarantino into the first movie star director, a hero for a generation of film fans. The critical stushy the film caused has been a strange one. Because the movie is trendy, modern, inventive, ironic, violent and foul-mouthed, all the things you'd think liberals would love, yet the liberals mostly hated it. In this country, the Independent called it swank in a vacuum. The Guardian said it had absolutely nothing to say. Conservative critics from the Times, the Mail and the Evening Standard liked it more. Right-wingers didn't seem to notice that it had no soul, no sense of injustice. I do have problems with the film. I don't like its lack of passion, and some of it seems homophobic. If there had been something that bridged the emotional gap between me and it, then I think Pulp Fiction would have been a truly great film, as well as a really important one. It all started sometime before Reservoir Dogs had made Tarantino's name. On hearing that the film might be a success, we actor-producer Danny DeVito commissioned him to write another script. The result was unlike anything he'd ever seen. Actor Samuel L. Jackson thought the opening scene was the best he'd ever read. Uma Thurman said it was terrifying. A then very untrendy actor called John Travolta wanted to be in it but thought he hadn't a hope. Just do a read-through of the second part. So we just say the, lock, say the words and then come in here and do the two shot. Cool. The jumping off point for the, for the piece was the idea of doing a, a, a crime film anthology. You know, I'd never seen a crime film anthology before. And yet those were like the ones, you know, that were like the most done in paperbacks, you know, like, like the Black Mask magazine and stuff. And so I thought of the idea of, of, of doing that in a film. And so I came up with like three stories and everything. And then upon sitting down and writing it, I started realizing, well, yeah, that's fun to do, the idea of like an anthology, but it could be really neat to do three separate stories, but have the same group of characters floating in and out of the three stories. Like this, or let me see, maybe this might be the case because we, then we got blocking from this blue thing here. I really like experimenting with a kind of cinema that you're not used to seeing, or taking the form and stretching it and twisting it and doing things uh, that, you know, that you're, you're, you're not used to seeing all the time. In the case of Pulp Fiction, part of the fun of it is the fact that you're seeing genre characters, but they're not necessarily talking about you know, just the normal stuff that genre characters talk about. You know the show's on TV? I don't watch TV. Yeah, but you are aware that there's an invention called television, and on this invention they show shows, right? Yeah. Well, the way they pick TV shows is they make one show. That show's called a pilot. And then they show that one show to the people who pick shows, and on the strength of that one show, they decide if they want to make more shows. Some get chosen and become television programs. Some don't, become nothing. They may be gangsters, but they're not just talking about gangster stuff like you're used to seeing in movies. They're talking about things that we all talk about. You know, so thus, you actually connect to, you know, you know, for as wild and violent or as whatever as they may be, there's also a spark of humanity. 
there's a character in the first story that's an important character. Now, he shows up in the second story. In the second story, he's got a small part. He's like, you know, if the whole movie had been the second story, he wouldn't even have a name. He'd be hood number one. Looking at something, friend? Ain't my friend, Palooka. The thing is, because you've seen the first story, he's not hood number one. You know who he is. You even like him, possibly. All right? You, you, you know, he's a person with a name, with a past, with a history, which you saw. And, but in the second story, he walks in like, like an extra and is taken out. And you're like, oh my God. When people ask me where, where, where do the characters come from, the answer is it comes from everywhere. It's a combination of figments of my imagination, uh, you know, ideas, uh, characters I've seen in other movies, characters I've, I've read in literature, uh, people I know, people I've met, people I've overheard, uh, uh, family, friend, family and friends, and myself. I mean, you can be all of that together. So tell me again about the hash part. Okay, what you want to know? Yeah, it's just legal there, right? Yeah, it's legal, but it ain't 100% legal. I mean, you just can't walk into a restaurant, roll the joint, and start puffing away. I mean, they want you smoking in your home or certain designated places. Tarantino tied it all together in the hash bars of Amsterdam while publicizing Reservoir Dogs. With this Dutch setting in mind, look at the second scene in the picture. Travolta and Jackson are talking about the differences between America and Europe. They make no boring, grand cultural generalizations. It's McDonald's and chips and mayonnaise they pick on that Tarantino picks on. Travolta's Vincent says that in Amsterdam you can walk into a cinema and buy a beer. It's as if Tarantino was writing a diary of his trip, keeping a list of his own nerdy observations. He hoovered up Amsterdam's garbage and spread it on the page. You know what they call a, a quarter pounder with cheese uh, in Paris? They don't call it a quarter pounder with cheese? No, man, they get the metric system. They wouldn't know what the fuck a quarter pounder is. And what do they call it? They call it a uh, Royale with cheese. Royale with cheese. That's right. What do they call a Big Mac? Big Mac's a Big Mac, but they call it Le Big Mac. A little big mac. <laughs> what do they call a wop? I don't know, I didn't go on a burger king. The result, I think, is hilarious. You laugh at how little an American can see of Europe, how brand names and junk food are everywhere, how out of history they are. Yet you kind of like Vincent because he's so dumb, so small-minded. Want some bacon? No, man, I don't eat pork. Are you Jewish? No, I ain't Jewish. I just don't dig on swine, that's all. Why not? Pigs are filthy animals. I don't eat filthy animals. Yeah, but bacon tastes good. Pork chops taste good. Hey, what makes this film so complicated that, is that while the content is incredibly American, the whole style is very European. It strikes me as extremely weird that Pulp Fiction, one of America's most vivid self-portraits, is stylistically so close to intellectual French avant-gardism. Look at the famous first scene in the diner with Tim Roth and Amanda Plummer. You just plunge into a sea of talk. There's no intro, no music, no establishing shot. Far from the operatic camera moves of Scorsese, far from the diner nostalgia of a hundred American films, here is a camera which is meditative, mostly static, at a distance, symmetrical, almost nailed to the floor. This austere style is pure mid-period Jean-Luc Godard. I'm through doing that shit. You always say that, the same thing every time. I'm through, never again, too dangerous. I know, that's what I always say, I'm always right too. But you forget about it in a day or two? Yeah, well the days of me forgetting are over, the days of me remembering have just begun. You know when you go on like this what you sound like? You sound like a sensible fucking man, that's what I sound like. You sound like a duck. Yeah, well take, oh, because you're never going to have to hear it again. Cause it, since I'm never going to do it again, you're never going to have to hear me quack that I'm never going to do it again. After tonight? Correct. I'm all tonight to quack. Watch Pulp Fiction with the sound off, and it's like a series of tableau, almost still images. It's a certain kind of art cinema mannerism. The fact that we don't come back to this scene in the diner until the end, and then brilliantly from another direction, makes it even more like Godard's famous dictum that movies should have a beginning, a middle and an end, but not necessarily in that order. I love you, pumpkin. I love you, honey bunny. Everybody be cool, this is a robbery! Any of you fucking pricks move! And I'll execute every motherfucking last one of you!
I'm trying to make comedies. I'm trying to make things, but in particular, I'm trying to make things funny that you're not used to seeing in a humorous light. All right, and I'm not necessarily doing it by making fun of it. Oftentimes, I'm trying to show it in such a realistic setting, but with the, the foibles of real life thrust onto this, you know, action adventure situation, but like how it would really play in real life, you know, so it starts seeming absurd. Die, you mother! Tarantino finds black humour in cold-blooded killings and hilariously accidental ones, as well as in sadomasochistic sex, torture, and a very scary heroin overdose. All this won't be to everyone's taste, but it's interesting that the British censor was more worried about the drug use, not the language and violence. He demanded only one small cut, reframing a close-up of an injection. The palm door goes to Pulp Fiction. The Conwin, all right, is like, that's a big shield. <laughs> you know, when they're throwing bricks at me on general principle because my films are violent or this or that and the other, all right, um, in some ways the Conwin is like a good, good thing that just says, you know, you're misunderstanding me. I'm not just about that. Here it is then, one of the most provocative and politically and culturally ambiguous films of its age. See what you think. This is BBC Two, where we like to show our films intact. Be warned, what you are about to see is not for the faint-hearted. Extreme use of violence, strong language and drug abuse. The hallmark of Pulp Fiction. Forget it, it's too risky. I'm through doing that shit. You always say that, the same thing every time. I'm through, never again, too dangerous. I know, that's what I always say. I'm always right, too. But you forget about it in a day or two. Yeah, well, the days of me forgetting are over. The days of me remembering have just begun. You know when you go on like this what you sound like? You sound like a sensible fucking man. That's you what I sound like. like. Yeah, you know, I'll take that oh, because you're never going to have to hear it again. Because it, since I'm never going to do it again, you're never going to have to hear me quack about I'm never going to do it again. After tonight? Correct. I'm going to alternate to quack.